And joining us now from New York, New York, to discuss uncovering torture, Jamil Jaffer, director of the National Security Project at the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. And Jamil, we're grateful you could spare some time for us on TVO tonight. How are you? Good, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Not at all. I want to take you back to the year 2003. You at the ACLU decided to make a Freedom of Information request related to the treatment of prisoners in American custody. Why did you want to do that? Well, that was, uh, it was right after a, a couple of news organizations here had reported that prisoners were being abused uh, in military custody and also in some of the CIA's detention facilities. Uh, and there were a couple of these news articles, one, one written in the Washington Post and another one in the New York Times. Uh, and we thought that uh, it would be useful to know whether those, um, those abuses were aberrational or whether they were representative of a, of a broader pattern. And so we, we thought that uh, the way to get at that would be to file a Freedom of Information Act request. And that's what we did in October of 2003. Uh, and then again in June of 2004, right after the Abu Ghraib photographs were, were broadcast uh, to the world by, by CBS and by, uh, by the New Yorker magazine. And what agencies of the U.S. government did you want documents from? We filed the request with a whole slew of federal agencies, including the CIA and the Defense Department, but also uh, the State Department, the Department of Justice, and including the Justice Department components, the FBI. Um, there, there was a, there were a whole slew of government agencies. At that time, we knew very little about what was going on and who was responsible for it. Um, and so it was really a, a very broad brush FOIA request, both in what we were asking for uh, and who we filed the, the, the request with. And when you made this initial request, what did you get back initially? Well, so the initial request was October 2003, and uh, I think the only thing we got between October of 2003 uh, and, and June of 2004 when we filed the lawsuit uh, was a set of talking points from the State Department, so it really wasn't very illuminating at all. Uh, for the most part, the, the, the agencies just stonewalled the request. They just ignored the request. Uh, and then after the Abu Ghraib photographs were released, uh, that's when it became clear to us that there was something uh, broader going on, that there was something serious going on, uh, and it wasn't just aberrational, uh, but, but, but could be systemic. And so after those photographs were released, we filed a lawsuit in, in a federal court here in New York uh, asking a judge to enforce uh, our right to information uh, under, under U.S. statutory law. Now, Jamil, obviously you've seen the documents, but our viewers haven't, and we want to give them some sense about what came back initially from the agencies. And here, for starters, is a 2004 document from the CIA's Office of the Inspector General. And this page, well, it's, it's I mean, there's nothing on it. It's basically all blacked out with the exception of one line. This is May 2008. Uh, the first version released. Uh, now let's go to version two, which was released in August 2009, and it looks as if you've got a bit of a table of contents here happening. There's a little bit more uh, that they uh, have decided to release. Uh, tell me more about the lawsuit and, and why you think it took that to get more information out of these mm -hmm. agencies. Well, well, you know, the first struggle we had was getting the agencies to respond at all. Um, and, and that's what the, the filing of the lawsuit was meant to do. It was meant to force the agencies to actually process our requests, meaning search for records that were responsive to our requests, uh, review them for possible release, uh, and, and release them. And uh, in August of 2004, a, a judge here in New York ordered exactly that, ordered the government to start processing the request. But then what they started to release in many cases were documents that were heavily redacted, uh, and you just showed one of those documents, documents that are, that are very heavily blacked out. And so the second struggle was, was uh, against those kinds of redactions, which in many cases, in our view, were, were completely unnecessary and completely unrelated to national security. Uh, in, in some of these cases, the, the CIA or the Defense Department would invoke national security as a justification for withholding the information, uh, but the context made clear that the reasons they were, they were withholding the information had nothing to do with national security, but were instead about uh, protecting senior officials from embarrassment, uh, or in some cases, concealing evidence of unlawful activity. And so we went back to the court, uh, in fact, we went back to the court dozens of times uh, to try to get the court to order the government to disclose information that it had initially redacted. Uh, in other words, information that it had initially decided to withhold from the public. And in some of those cases, we were able to, to actually prevail, and in others, we weren't. 
Uh, but the document you just showed is an instance in which ultimately we were able to get uh, a less redacted version um, of what they had initially produced. Now tell me if this was your experience as well, because I've heard from journalists up here who say when they make freedom of information requests or access to information requests, uh, the first response they get back is, sure, we'd be happy to provide whatever you like, send us a million dollars for printing costs and you can have whatever you want. Did you get those kinds of you know, vexatious obstacles as well? Well, we, we definitely got vexatious obstacles. That's not one that we got in this particular case. Um, the way that the, the Freedom of Information Act works down here in the States, uh, you, can, you can get a fee waiver if you are a particular kind of organization, a media organization or a public interest organization. In some cases, it's necessary to fight about whether you're entitled to a, a fee waiver or not. Uh, in this case, uh, they didn't come back to us and say, you need to pay us a million dollars. Instead, what they came back and said was that, uh, that, that uh, we're withholding these documents on national security grounds. Now, at, at one point we had asked for expedited processing. We made the argument that these documents were of particular importance to an ongoing national debate uh, and time was of the essence and, um, and the documents should be released sooner rather than later. And uh, some of the agencies came back and said, uh, no, these documents are not of, uh, uh, of, any, public, uh, of any value to the public debate at all. Uh, these are documents that should be processed in the ordinary processing uh, scheme and not, not, not faster than, than, than is usually the case. I think that, that uh, in retrospect, it's quite obvious that that was just another stalling tactic. It, it would have been obvious to anyone who looked at these records in 2004 uh, or 2003 uh, that these records were of, of, of uh, extraordinary importance to the public debate, but that's not what the agency said at the time. I'd like to next read a portion of a document that you helped make public. This is from an autopsy report from the Office of the Armed Forces Medical Examiner, and the language is pretty harsh. Here's what you managed to get out. Opinion. This approximately 35-year-old Afghan male detainee died of blunt force injuries to the lower extremities, complicating underlying coronary artery disease. The manner of death is homicide. How representative would that be of the kind of stuff you saw? Well, we unfortunately, it, it's not uh, a unique document. Uh, we did get dozens of documents relating to the deaths of prisoners in U.S. custody, uh, including many autopsy reports relating to prisoners who, who had been killed during interrogations. Uh, and this was, you know, obviously shocking to us, and I think it's, it's still news to, to many American citizens uh, that this is something that took place in, in U.S. detention facilities. And if you look at those autopsy reports, uh, I mean, you, you read from one of them, but, but there are, as I said, dozens of them. If you look at these autopsy reports, they really are horrific. Uh, some, of the, some of the deaths that are reported are, are deaths of people who are literally uh, beaten to death. There, were, there are other deaths of people who are suffocated. Uh, in one case, there was a, a prisoner who was found hanging from, from the ceiling by his arms uh, with a gag in his mouth. And those are, those are things that uh, maybe you expect from, um, from, from Saddam Hussein's Iraq or something like that, but... but uh, I don't think anybody expected it uh, from the United States. And well, yet, some, some these are the government's own documents. Some people in the United States called those enhanced interrogation techniques. Um, according to the documents you obtained, who in your, well, who made the decision to get more aggressive in the interrogating of these prisoners? Well, it was a decision made at the very top. I think for a long time the Bush administration was successful in, in persuading the public that, that the abuse was aberrational. Uh, that it took place in spite of policy, not because of policy. Uh, but some of the documents we got are interrogation directives issued by, uh, for example, then Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, uh, an interrogation directive issued by Lieutenant General Sanchez, who is the highest ranking military commander in Iraq. Uh, and then some of the documents we got are, are legal memos written by the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, and these are the highest ranking Justice Department officials. These are people who are supposed to be the conscience of the government, uh, and instead they were writing memos to, to justify torture. Uh, and, and so I think it's quite clear now, based on the documents we've got, uh, that the decision to abuse prisoners and the decision to endorse torture was a decision that was made by the senior most Bush administration officials. Now that's not to say that in every case a senior official actually ordered what took place in the interrogation room. Uh, or that a senior official ordered the, the killing of a prisoner. We don't have any document that shows that a senior official ordered the killing of a prisoner. Uh, but we do uh, have many, many documents showing that senior officials endorsed abuse, endorsed torture, 
Uh, and I think it's quite clear that the result, what you see in the detention centers, uh, all, all the awful, awful things that took place in the detention centers, both the CIA facilities and the military facilities, uh, was the result of the decisions made at the top. When you say at the top, any evidence that the President of the United States himself knew about this? Well, I think it depends what you mean by this. Um, President, President Bush was the one who, who directed the CIA early in 2000, in, 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 uh, right after the September 11th attacks, uh, directed the CIA to set up secret prisons abroad. Uh, and President Bush was the one who said uh, these prisoners should be afforded protections of the Geneva Conventions, but only to the extent consistent with military necessity. So I do think that President Bush um, uh, has to take a certain amount of responsibility for what happened. Uh, but the documents we have we, that have actual signatures on them I have the signatures of Justice Department lawyers, uh, of Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, um, of, of CIA officials. Uh, so there's, there's plenty of blame to go around, but, but I think most of the blame belongs uh, at the top of the CIA, the top of the Defense Department, uh, in, the C in the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, uh, and then to some extent with President Bush and Vice President Cheney as well. How do you think prisoners, I guess I should ask it this way, do you think prisoners, as a result of the work you have done, that are in American detention camps, uh, now treated differently? Well, I, I can't say that it's, it's, it's solely because of the work that the ACLU has done. The ACLU has, has, uh, you know, has litigated these Freedom of Information Act requests, but we have also relied heavily on the work of investigative journalists uh, and even in this Freedom of Information Act litigation, we've had, uh, we've had allies. We, we represent, in this case, not just the ACLU, but the Center for Constitutional Rights, Veterans for Peace, Veterans for Common Sense, uh, Physicians for Human Rights. So it's a whole coalition of, of uh, human rights and civil liberties organizations. But I think that collectively, uh, civil society organizations in the United States and defense lawyers in the United States have managed to uh, to make clear to the public that this narrative that the Bush administration introduced, uh, the narrative of rogue soldiers, of, of a few bad apples, uh, that that narrative is completely false. And, and by changing that narrative, I do think that um, uh, collectively we've managed to, to change the policies of the U.S. government. I, right after President Obama uh, took office, uh, he announced that he would shut down the CIA secret prisons and that he would take torture off the table. Uh, and obviously, we think those are those are those are very good decisions, uh, and they were decisions that that uh, were made possible or made um, decisions that were made uh, because of the way that that public opinion had changed over over the last eight years. Let's, for argument's sake, look at the other side of this, which is, I don't have to tell you, the ACLU has a very controversial history in the United States, particularly with some more conservative thinking people. Uh, the people who have been detained by the American government are not, I think it's fair to say, in almost every situation, not nice people. Uh, some people think you have now made it harder for the United States to win the global war on terror, uh, as it has been referred to. What do you say right. to that? I mean, I, 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 I don't think that there's any truth in that at all. I mean, I think, first of all, if you listen to uh, people with actual interrogation experience, listen to the FBI agents who have been interrogating people for years, uh, and what they explain is that torture in many cases is not just ineffective, but counterproductive. That there's information you could otherwise get from people that you will not obtain if you use torture. And if you look at the FBI documents that, that, that we were able to obtain through the, through the Freedom of Information Act, uh, what you see over and over again uh, are FBI agents complaining uh, about the methods that military interrogators are using. And the complaint isn't that uh, these methods are illegal, although they are illegal. The complaint is that these methods are ineffective and in some cases counterproductive. Um, and that's a complaint that you see over and over again in the documents. And since the documents have been released, uh, not just FBI interrogators, but military interrogators and CIA interrogators, the current Secretary of Defense, all of these people have said uh, that torture is something that is not only helping our national security policies, but hurting it. Uh, and, and I don't think you have to rely on the ACLU to tell you that. There are, there are literally dozens of people with real interrogation experience who say that. Jamil, what are you still hoping to uncover? Well, we, we do think it's important that the public have a, a complete record of, of what took place in these facilities. And, and so we're trying to fill in the gaps in the, in the record. Uh, one, of the, one of the sets of, of, of records that we're trying to get right now are photographs depicting the abuse of prisoners at, at facilities other than Abu Ghraib. 
So the Abu Ghraib photos have already been leaked, as ever, and everybody has seen them. Uh, but there are similar photographs from fo from uh, facilities other than Abu Ghraib, uh, all over Iraq, all over Afghanistan, uh, and those are photographs that the government is still withholding. Um, we think that the, it's important that the public have access to those photographs. Uh, the photos show the abuse in a way that words can't uh, actually convey. Uh, it's one thing to read that uh, that a prisoner was subjected to a stress position, and it's another thing to see a photograph of what that actually looks like uh, throughout history. Um, human rights advocates have been able to use photographs to, to advance the cause of human rights, and we think that uh, the release of these photographs would help us do that uh, as well. So that's something that we're focused on right now. Uh, and then there are also a series of interrogation directives used by special forces in Afghanistan that are still being withheld. Uh, we're trying to get those as well. Uh, more generally, I think that the goal right now is, is not just transparency, but, but accountability. Uh, because though quite a bit of information has now been released, uh, the only people who have been held responsible for the abuse of prisoners are low-ranking soldiers, uh, military personnel who were uh, held responsible for what happened at Abu Ghraib. And, and, and I don't have any issue with holding people who abuse prisoners responsible for their actions. Uh, but to pretend that this was um, a problem that was caused by uh, and caused only by rogue soldiers, by a few bad apples, uh, I think is, is completely inconsistent with the documents that we've got. Uh, there's a responsibility for, for, for all of this at the very top, and we think that people at the top should be held responsible. Uh, and that's something that we hope we'll be able to achieve through the disclosure of more of these documents. Okay. Let me make, uh, in our last couple of minutes here, a bit of a hard turn because our viewers, some of them, probably most of them, don't know. You're from here. You are a Canadian. You were born in the province of Ontario. Your parents still live in Kingston, Ontario. And I want to ask you a bit about Canada. Um, sure. You, I think, actually, you clerked for a Supreme Court judge once. So you've got, uh, you've got a lot of legal chops built up in this country, if I can put it that way. And I guess the question is, you know what's possible in the United States, given the access to information laws they have down there. What about up here? Could you do up here what you've done down there, given the state of our laws up here? Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, there are people, as you know, in, in Canada doing this kind of work. There are some great organizations up there doing human rights and civil liberties work. Um, the, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association is one of them. Uh, Amnesty is another. Uh, and these organizations do do some of the same work that the ACLU does uh, down here. Um, it's, it's, I think, harder in Canada. It's harder in Canada for, for at least two reasons. One is that uh, there isn't the funding in Canada that there is in the United States. Uh, for this kind of work. There just aren't the philanthropies, the big foundations uh, in Canada that there are in the United States. And I think that makes it more difficult. Uh, and the other thing that makes it more difficult is that the access to information uh, statute in Canada is not as strong as the American statute. Uh, I think on paper it might be as strong, but in the United States there is a, a, is a long history now, uh, 40 years of, of, of jurisprudence interpreting the Freedom of Information Act uh, and that jurisprudence gives advocates a certain amount of power uh, when it comes to agencies, federal agencies, that, that refuse to disclose information. Now, it doesn't guarantee victory, and it, it, you know, as you've seen, as you can see from our own experience, it took us seven or eight years to get to where we are now. Uh, so, so the act here certainly is not perfect. Um, but relatively speaking, the, the United States have, has a very strong uh, Freedom of Information Act, and that's made our work. Uh, again, relatively speaking, easier than it is, I think, in other countries. Jamil Jaffer from the ACLU, it's good of you to spend some time with us on TVO tonight. Uh, thank thank you. you very much.